Thank you very much, Des, for a very elegant uh, paper. Um, one of the things that I was, um, I'm, I'm speaking, of course, as you well know, um, um, as not as a Kant person, but one of the one of the things I was a little surprised not to hear anything about was the distinction between causality at the noumenal and the phenomenal level, um, because it it seems that can you say a little bit about how that distinction and um, um, notion of cause, uh, when you're talking about divine concurrence, presumably you're talking at the noumenal level, what what Andrew called uh, the nozzle level, uh, or maybe it may be easier to call it the end causal as opposed to the p causal level. Right. Um, and if so, um, don't we have to? Doesn't that entail that we can do a whole lot of metaphysics at the uh, n causal level? that seems to be at least in some tension with um, Kantian um, um, uh, constraints about um, what it is that we can know and what it is that we can't. Right. It's definitely in a lot of tension with traditional interpretations of Kant's theory of causality. It's not necessarily in that much tension with the new uh, advanced theories of Kant's <laughs> interpretations of Kant's theory of causality. For example, the one laid out in Eric Watkins's book uh, so you have to you have to ask yourself at some point when you're studying Kant what you know what are the ultimate causal forces that drive the world and where do they fit in in the Kantian system are they are, are they at the phenomenal level are they at the noumenal level? Kant says clearly in the passage that God creates the noumenal level, right? So this comes out much more as Karl Marx has pointed out in lecture transcripts than in published works. In the lecture transcripts, it seems very clear that Kant retains a notion of noumenal substance. With uh, endowed with forces, the phenomenal world arises out of that. So really, in a way, the causally efficacious part of the picture is going to have to reside largely at the noumenal level. And so it's not all that surprising that you find that when Kant locates creation at the noumenal level, that he should also locate concurrence with created causes and so on at the noumenal level. Of course, you then have to say, what's the story with, ph with phenomenal causation? On some views, that isn't real. There are lots of interpretations of what's going on there, but one view is that that's more like um, a regularity among phenomena, right, rather than uh, real causation in the sense of, so the causal law of the second analogy says um, you have to have, where, where you have an effect, for every, for every change there has to be a, a cause, and where you have this cause, the effect will necessarily follow. Does that just describe a regularity? Does that describe, describe a real relation of causation? And if it does describe a real relation of causation, what is the causally efficacious factor? Where does it reside? Is it somewhere beneath the surface of the phenomena? That, that's one plausible reading, I think. Um, on the issue of violation of the strictures, I think it's important to distinguish between what Kant absolutely needs and what he also talks about. So what he absolutely needs is a theory of creation and conservation, etc. that fits with his theory of the highest good, his moral theology, and his account of free agency. Uh, he can be indifferent with respect to how a lot of this stuff works. You know, say the action of causes which are act in accordance with natural determinism. He doesn't have to fill in all of the details about that. However, he does want to say that the concurrentist account there is incoherent. He wants to say that much. So you can actually. It, it, he, he may seem to be saying a lot here, but if you look at the particular arguments he's giving, so he rules out occasionalism for what seems to be a good reason. He, he needs real finite causes for his moral philosophy. Um, he rules out concurrence because he thinks he's got a conceptual objection against it. If it's a conceptual objection, I mean, it's an objection that it's impossible. So he can say, if it's impossible, it's impossible. Noumenal level, phenomenal level, I can rule it out. What am I left with? By the process of elimination, I'm left with mere conservationism. If I want to be, have a theistic picture, which I need for my moral theology, I can't be an occasionalist. I can't be a concurrentist. I'm a mere conservationist. So it, I think it works that way. Oops. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, you have to give it oh, a sorry. Um, so two questions. Uh, I'm wondering whether you think there's logical space uh, for a position between mere conservationism and concurrentism. And second, I'm wondering if you do think there's logical space for some position between those positions, um, why not think that Kant would colonize that space given that his general modus operandi is to um, synthesize different positions, try to, to find middle ground. Spaces. And that's and that's yeah, and that's what he does with uh, in this debate between physical influx, occasionalism, and pre-established harmony. It looks like he wants to have this sort of hybrid uh, physical influx, pre-established harmony view. Why not think that he's trying to find something between concurrentism and mere conservationism? And so all the textual evidence that you might find that suggests in the pre-critical and the critical period that he doesn't want to be a concurrentist. Why not take that to mean? So why take that to mean that he's opting for mere conservationism as opposed to some middle position between those? Um, my my only reason for that is that I can't see any evidence for, uh, you know, a positive middle position. What I see evidence for is clearly the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of conservation, the rejection of concurrence. Now, if he did give us hints that he had further things to say and he wasn't entirely happy with mere conservationism, for example, he thought. He endorsed some of the traditional objections to Durandus that it leads you in the direction of a deistic metaphysics, then you might have some positive reason to say, oh, he must be looking for some other view. But he just doesn't give us any such positive view. And the other thing is, I can't, we have enough trouble trying to figure out if, occur, if concurrence is really coherent, right? So um, to figure out a position between conservation and concurrence, a positive position, first of all, that is coherent seems just as hard or even harder. So my reason is just basically that the texts definitely support attribution of conservation to him, but not any positive view between conservation and concurrence. Can just follow up real quickly. Um, so there's the new elucidation where he has this, uh, you know, this idea that God not only creates substances, but also has to think of them as related in certain ways. So yeah. he wants to distinguish. It looks like he wants to say God doesn't just um, create the things and keep them in existence. In addition, he has to do this other thing. And I'm wondering, yeah. doesn't his Kant's thinking that God does this other thing, doesn't that make him more than a mere conservationist? And then depending on how he cashes out the other thing, he may or may not be a concurrentist. Good, that's very good. Uh, that's the section of the paper I left out. But you, if you can look at the passage on page three, there is some hint at, a, at an answer there. The one right in the middle, the schema of the divine understanding, the origin of existences, is an enduring act called conservatio. And in that act, if substances are conceived as existing in isolation, they're isolated. If they're conceived as connected, they're connected. What he does there is the connecting act you're talking about there, which seems to be something above and beyond the mere creation, he actually includes it as a part of the act of conservation. He says, in that act, if God conceives of them as interacting, then they interact. So it seems to be the case that if you look very carefully at his language here, uh, that's something above and beyond their mere creation is also contained in the act of, of conservation. And that would go pretty well with uh, an interpretation of this that Karl Amrix gave a few years back. I don't know who was based on looking at that particular passage, but I think Karl used language something like, in the very act of creating them, he makes them interactive. So in that sense, that wouldn't be evidence for a position beyond mere conservationism. Thanks, Des. That was a really great paper. Um, I basically just have kind of one long question that maybe has three parts. And it's along the lines of, why does Kant think that it's OK to be a mere conservationist again after Durandus has been taking all this heat for so many years and has been, if not you know, excommunicated, certainly um, not preferred by the church? Quick so, answer. Yeah. First of all, I don't think he knows about Durandus. Second of all, he, he's not afraid of being a heretic about various things, including grace. Right. So. so the question is, does, I mean, the first of the three sub-questions is, does um, Pelagianism no longer matter? Oh, God has withheld again. But there's still electricity in your mic, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, so, He hasn't withdrawn all the power. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 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 
It's the glory right. that Marilyn was speaking about. It's the glory that surrounds your body. So that's just a kind of historical question. Why isn't he worried about Pelagianism anymore? Um, one having to do with his own objections to concurrentism would be if he thinks of concurrentism as requiring a kind of overdetermination, um, and that's his objection to it, if he then accepts, as you say, and as I think I agree, a kind of concurrentism in the grace case or in the moral case, aren't there overdetermination objections that are going to arise there? Why would he be willing to accept, accept it there if he wasn't willing to accept it in the kind of physical case? Yeah. And then the last one would just be, why isn't he concerned? I mean, you mentioned the contra naturum argument and that you know various people argue against Durandus on the basis of the thought that, well, you know, God would have to be willing in doing miracles against natures in some important sense. Yeah. Kant doesn't really bring it up, but why did you suggest that it wouldn't be an impressive argument to him? Is that something to do with transcendental idealism or something else? Um, okay, so in order, uh, yeah. the first question, why doesn't he worry about Pelagianism because he likes Pelagianism, he is a Pelagian, I suppose would be the right answer. There's so he just accepts Pelagianism the... has a certain attraction. I mean, I think Bob agrees with this. If you look at his theory of prevenient grace, the idea that you, you know, he's, he allows grace, the possibility of grace, but yeah. he's clearly in violation of Christian orthodoxy on, on, according to which you cannot do anything with any moral value without grace. So just allowing that it's possible well, is heretical, according to you know, the canons of the Council of trained from the Council of, Council of Carthage. So you um, think he's just willing to accept the heretical label at that point? So unlike oh. Leibniz, who, of, who often argues from you know, the conditions of divine sovereignty, and in, in that way is much more in line with traditional Christian concerns, Kant, you often find him arguing from the conditions of moral agency, yeah. and then trying to fit it together with the traditional theistic metaphysics. And I think his view is just clearly Pelagian just is the answer to that. And that's, he thinks it, you have to be a Pelagian because of something like the Stoic principle that came up yesterday. Yeah. Why is concurrentism okay in the case of grace, in the case of free acts? Because that argument only applies, it's based on a principle that if causes are fully determined by God's predetermining providence, then if he were to concur, he would be overdetermining. The idea is that free acts aren't fully fixed by God's predetermining providence, so the conceptual objection doesn't apply to that case, so it leaves open the possibility of room of concurrence with free acts in that case. Although, I mean, it's a splitting conception of concurrence, right? So he, do, he still doesn't get the no splitting objection. Um, I, I, so what I, what I was saying was that because he's not a, a concurrentist, I, I wasn't sure about this part of the paper, actually, but, yeah. you know, the concurrentist has to satisfy a no splitting constraint. Kant yeah. is a mere conservationist, so he can throw away these traditional constraints. So when it comes to grace as um, operating in the context of providential control, yeah. The, aim, the, the aim there of God is just to make sure that things are going in accordance with his purposes. So whether he does it by just doing something all on his own, by cooperating with the creature, it doesn't really seem to matter very much. When it comes to the issue of the creature's moral worth in action and God's uh, uh, cause of contribution there, I'm not exactly sure what to say. Yeah. Sometimes Kant says he, he seems to um, insinuate that God would cooperate by making the moral law shine a little bit brighter or something like that, altering yeah. your incentives. Uh, how this, you know, whether he's got a story about splitting or no splitting yeah. of effects is not just not clear. Mm. On the contra naturum thing, the contra naturum argument for um, concurrence, um, I mean, I found that a bit weird when I first encountered it. The idea that here is a great argument for concurrence. <laughs> if you're a conservationist, your account of God's um, the metaphysics of contra naturum miracles has to involve God thwarting the activity of creatures. So the, the three boys are, are thrown into the fire. According to the book of Daniel, they're not consumed by flames. Yeah. How, what's the metaphysics of the miracles? The mere conservation, conservationist seems to have to say, you know, down flames, Thorn, back, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But God <laughs> created the flames, and so Suarez thinks that's unbecoming. Right. And so he says, right. much better that he can, he can control them from the inside, so to speak. They can't burn unless he concurs with their activity. He withdraws his concurrence. That's fine. Just as he doesn't have to destroy you to annihilate you, he only has to withdraw his conserving support. Right, right. Why is Kant not impressed by that? Yeah. Uh, well, are you impressed by that? It would be one <laughs> thing to say. Uh, you know, yeah, if you sure, think yeah. yourself into a certain theistic framework, is bad. that can be, I suppose, an impressive argument. Mm -hmm. Ferdoso reports when he's discussing.